now, I'll start now and go backwards a little bit. Now it's much more difficult, if not outright impossible, to for a cartoon to be uh, the national conversation, which used to be, you know, the norm. Um, it used to be that people would gather around the, you know, proverbial water cooler and just say, did you see Calvin and Hobbes today? And everybody had seen Calvin and Hobbes that day and everybody knew what you were talking about, so everybody was included and and uh, and and everybody could participate in you know the national uh, conversation, and this was true of movies and TV shows, a particular episode of something or a book, and now that's uh, much much more infrequent because of the tsunami of just stuff, you know, data in all its forms, in our case, it's graphic and uh, just pollution. You just, you, you know, what do you look at? And if you do pick something to look at for a moment, 10 seconds later, something else is going to get your attention and you're there and you, you really haven't assimilated this thing. So uh, this is the environment that artists and um, writers and any uh, creative people actually are up against. And frankly, it's just as bad for the people who supposedly complete the transaction of art, meaning the readers, the people who see the art, people look, because they're not getting, they don't, they don't have time to like let something, you know, absorb something and think about it, and let it become part of their DNA, and then they move on to something else. And then, no, it's, 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 it's a machine gun. Uh, it's a machine gun, but all the shots it's taken are very shallow, very shallow. So you don't really, you don't really get a lot of all of it. And so for the cartoonist today, or any artist, the trick is hoping. Well, my hope is that everybody's becoming so desensitized to the tsunami that the authentic voice, then, which is so shocking and so surprising as truth usually is stands out. And when that stands out, you, it'll find its devoted following. And the person that has something to say that's honest, and by something to say, I don't mean just a storyteller, I mean graphically, visually, musically, however, um, they will build a nice relationship with a very devoted uh, following that gets it, that appreciates it, and both ends of that transaction are elevated. That is that is the hope today. No, no, I, I say, and I'm, and I'm still grateful for that. I still read the paper. I'm so lucky that I get to, you know, I work for, uh, you know, the Washington Post. I work for the newspaper that, where I learned how to read. I grew up there, and I, I looked at my first cartoons in print there, and uh, learned about the world through the stories and the writing. And that I, that I grew up to work there is, you know, it's a a very, very nice thing in my life. That's probably closer to the truth, uh, the second one. Um, uh, I, I used to do political cartoons. I did political cartoons for USA Today, and then I went out on my own and would do uh, a variety of political fare for other publications, and I actually grew uh, bored with politics, and what you said a moment ago had a little bit to play into it is uh, and this is just me, I'm not saying this, but all cartoonists, obviously, some great, great political cartoonists. Um, most of them are dead now, but you know, there were some great ones. Uh, I think the greatest living one still is Pat Oliphant. Um, but I became bored with the, the whole concept of, like you said, an event happens, and then, you know, 600 cartoonists focus on that one thing, do take their take on it, comes out the next day. Um, and God, there's so much overlap. And, and then you flip through old books of cartoons and you see that the, you know, the Thomas Nast commentary on the decline of the economy in the late 1800s, that's not so different than the cartoon you're gonna see on the same subject today. It just didn't, hold my attention. I didn't have that particular fire in the belly 
to go after it that way. And I had always been drawn to relationships. And just relationships meaning just like watching people interact and, you know, why, you know, why, why does that guy have a comb over and why are his short sleeves rolled up once or twice? What does that say? Or the way he's holding his wife's hand or how he gently interrupts her and corrects and like thinking, well, what's that like in private if that's what they're like in public? And this kind of thing. Uh, you know, what, this woman, when she's talking, she's, she always says her own name. You know, when she's quoting people, she uses her name. That means something. And I start thinking about those kinds of dynamics and relationships and insecurities and strengths and weaknesses. And uh, so I, I wanted to comment on things that have been happening between us since we lived in caves. But I felt like I could, I had something to say that was mine about these, and therefore new, or, or different at least, about these very, very old things like insecurity and jealousy and love and on and on. So um, uh, that, that, that actually grew out of and piggybacked on to my, she was my wife, now she's my former wife, uh, Carolyn Hacks, uh, created uh, what is, you know, indisputably the country's best advice column. Advice columns basically fall into three categories. Uh, Carolyn Hacks, uh, those that want to be Carolyn Hacks, and those that are lying. And um, her great editor, Peggy Hackman, had the idea of like, well, um, your husband, who's now freelancing, could do a little icon to go with it, sort of said. But I did a, I, I liked the idea, I did a freestanding cartoon that is obviously connected to uh, the advice, uh, it's often tenuously connected to the advice, but it stands alone. So, you know, my collection of my cartoons in my book, uh, um, if, if You Loved Me, You'd Think This Was Cute, Uncomfortably True Cartoons About You, uh, you see, they, all, they all stand by themselves. And um, you brought up the the single panel a little while ago. I, the single panel was imposed on me because of, of space considerations, but uh, I tr try to create something that makes you consider, you know, what happened a moment before and then what is about to happen. Just to grab that, just pick that right slice. Try, I often fail, but uh, sometimes when you hit it, it's a nice thing. Actually, uh, the author of Calvin and Hobbes, Bill Watterson, and the uh, great, great uh, uh, illustration uh, historian, he has he's probably got the, the, the best blog on illustration and particularly draftsmanship, David Apatoff. We came together and, and made the book uh, The Art of Richard Thompson. We authored The Art of Richard Thompson, a couple other people involved, but uh, Richard, Richard Thompson, as, as history is acknowledging, and as certainly the, the peaks in our field acknowledges, I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's easy because it's true to say he's one of the greatest artists, certainly one of the greatest cartoonists, writers, uh, to, ever in our industry, ever. I mean, ever. You go all the way back to Windsor McKay through Crazy Cat, and Pogo, and Charles Schultz, and Bill himself, and you know Richard Thompson is is right up there. And then you can jump into another genre and go into illustration. And, you know, start with N.C. Wyeth, work your way up through Bernie Fuchs and our, our own Peter DeSev, and Richard is right in that conversation. And then you step over again and move into caricature. And let's start with Hirschfeld and move into David Levine and, and, and Philip Burke and Steve Brodner and the great John Cash, who I also pulled in to interview Richard for the book, and Richard's right up there with them. And then you throw a boomerang, writing. Richard may have been a better writer than he was at any of those things, and he was among the best at those things. The guy's a freak. That's why Bill, who um, 
He's a private person, as most people know. And, uh, no one had heard from Bill for many, many years after he retired Calvin Hobbes, which had been retired now for 22 years. And he was exposed to Richard's comic strip, Cul-de-sac, and he felt compelled to come, come out, send a message out, essentially saying, now I have a reason to look at comics again. And that, of course, led to his investment in the artist and the person. They became friendly. Richard and I have been friends for decades. And we came together to make this book uh, a couple years ago. Beautiful book, uh, great work. And uh, Richard got to see it, got to see the uh, appreciation uh, from uh, many people in this industry, animation and, and others. I took the book on a book tour. I went through all of the studios and uh, Tina, Tina Price was kind enough to give me this wonderful venue and event at CTN, very well attended. Uh, forever grateful to her for that. For she, just, she got it, you know, she just got it. And it was an extraordinary event. Um, and where, wherever I was with this book, people, people who know, you know, where Ralph Eggleston and and Pete Doctor and uh, Paul Felix and the Carter Goodrich and well, Carter's an old friend and, and knew of Richard's work a while ago. Nico Marlet, all these people would see the work, this underexposed artist, and they would be almost apologetic in there, like, "Wow, I, I had no idea." Everywhere I went, I would run around, I had no idea, I had no idea that this, uh, this genius was out there because there's probably never been a less ambitious genius in the world than Richard, but those that know, know. And Richard uh, got to experience some of that and was suffering from Parkinson's, so he had to stop, which was more fuel to make the book, but he got to experience it, he got to see that others were paying attention and uh, he finally passed away this past uh, July, late July. Um, he was my great friend and I miss him quite a lot. It's, it's hugely important and it's wildly paralyzing apparently. Um, it's important because it's how we learn, and not just in the craft, but you know, you see the possibility of things that other artists have done, and they've taken risks and tried this or that. So there's that example, and then there's of course the the actual learning and looking at the work, and oh, look at how he he understood balance, and maybe I can do that in gesture and any number of things, light and shadow, and you know, all of the things that an artist, for example. We'll say artists here you because know, writers have the same thing and musicians have the same thing in their world, but that lineage is deeply, deeply important. It's how we learn. But then we, too many of us, offend that lineage. You know, to, to have all the skill in the world, which so many of these people do, that tent has got a tremendous amount of, uh, God, these amazing gifts. And to have all of that and, and look at, you know, say Mary Blair and say, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stop right there. I'm gonna be Mary Blair. Well, where's your voice? Where, you know, you, you, uh, you, you know, you look at, uh, I'll move over one of those. The, probably nobody's more copied ever than the great Frank Frazetta. Illustrator Frazetta. If you take, if you take Frazetta out of the trajectory of what he did, an entire industry radically changes, if not completely evaporates. You're talking about fantasy and science fiction illustration, and uh, a good chunk of comic books. They just, if you take Frazetta, we don't know how things change, but undeniably they do change. He's on the trunk of the tree. And so many of these great artists just look at Frazetta and they're like, okay, I just want to be Frazetta. I had a conversation with Frazetta once and I asked him, you know, we were talking about a variety of things, mostly baseball, because you know, if you know, he was, he was actually drafted to play baseball and often regretted not playing professional baseball. He felt he could have been a better 
a baseball player than he was an illustrator, which is stunning. That would have made him Babe Ruth or, you know. And, and he said in his wonderful, innocent comment, he says, I asked him, I said, are you, does it bother you? Are you bitter? Are you, you see, everybody's doing, they're doing vines the way you are. They're doing cliffs and women and action, all of the swords and the pyramid compositions and the whole thing. And does it, you know, they're making a gajillion dollars and you've been lumped in with them instead of being credited as the root of all of this. Does it bother you? And he said, it was such a great thing. He's what he said. He goes, I never, I never understood why anybody would want to be a second rate me instead of a first rate them. And he said that and I thought, well, of course, he thinks that. That's how you get to be Frazetta. It never occurred to Frazetta to, you know, he had his influences. All of us have our influences. Every art, every of the great, unique artists, you know, you take take Peter Desev, take Carter Goodrich, uh, take Nico uh, Marley, you know, who are, are inarguably on the Mount Rushmore of character design. Those guys have their influences. But lineage, and influence should be like, um, should be like, it's like perfume. Perfume can be really cheap. Cheap perfume smells sort of, uh, it's, it's strong and it smells the same on anybody that wears it. Good perfume, expensive let's say, good quality perfume actually uniquely interacts with your body chemistry to give off a completely different scent, unique to you. And that's how influences should be. You, you, you learn from these people. Uh, I, I just, um, I had the pleasure of writing, Peter Desev asked me, we're, we're longtime friends, and he asked me to write the essay inducting him into the Hall of Fame, the Illustrator's Hall of Fame. And there's a paragraph where I, I, the way I handle his influences, and they're all influences on him, and you, but, but he, he absorbed those things, he learned from them, he copied, took what was needed, made it part of his DNA, and broke away. And, and, but it's all, you know, it all went into the stew, but it's a stew, so that the dominant thing that came out on the other end was Peter DeSev utterly unlike anybody else. He has, there are people who try to draw like him, um, but the only people who should be trying to draw like him, being to, tra to draw like Carter, are people who want to learn and are also then following somebody else and somebody else so that you just, you're adding arrows into your quiver. You're not saying Carter Goodrich, that's what I'm going to put that arrow and that's it. I'm going to be a poor man's Carter Goodrich for the rest of my life. I can draw like a god, but I'm just going to be a Nico Marley wannabe. I don't understand that. I, I do understand that logistically people come out of school, they got to get a job, they got loans, they happen to do this, they stop on their big crush, Mary Blair and hope to get work, and maybe they do. They're inexpensive, they, you know, it's perpetuated by an industry that won't give artists time to find themselves, find their voices, but man, there's nothing more rewarding, and ultimately nothing more fun than finding your authentic, your authentic voice. And, and most artists, even if they're interested in doing so, but most never quite get there. And that authenticity goes back to what we were saying earlier about cutting through the tsunami of stuff that you're bombarded with.